welcome. We're glad you're with us this morning. Uh, we hope that uh, everyone has their Bibles available to them. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2. We'll be in verses t uh, 18 through 29. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. While everybody is getting their Bibles, uh, while you at home are going to get your Bible and getting ready, um, let me say that the the Church of Thyatira, uh, this is the longest message that was sent to any of the churches, and it's the smallest city. Thyatira was a military town as well as a commercial center with many trade guilds. Wherever guilds were found, idolatry and immorality, the two great enemies of the early church were almost always present too. The Church of Thyatira, Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds, and your love, and your faith, and service, and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Wow. That's a lot to say for this church who lived in a small city that was full of trade guilds and immorality. I know your deeds and your love and your faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But the angel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze says this, but I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations." and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is your word. We thank you for the power that's contained in your word. Father, there's a deep lesson here to be learned and help us to not harden our hearts. Help the hearers to hear with an open heart. Help our everyone who is watching this by video or by who is here today, let them have a teachable heart. Let their heart be open to the things of God. Father, we pray that we would be so in love with Jesus Christ that we would understand that the same Jesus who died on the cross for us in spite of ourselves is the one who's going to judge us. And he's judging the church. And Lord, the church in America is being judged. 
we have gone astray. We have let the woman Jezebel, that prophetess, come in and teach us idolatrous ways. We have committed fornication with the world because of these evil ways. Lord God, help us, help our hearts, help our minds to be focused on you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> It's very significant that the Lord Jesus Christ presented himself in each of these letters in such a way so as to meet the special condition in which each church is found. When he addressed himself to the church of Thyatira, he spoke solemnly as the Son of God. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ in writing to his, this church emphasize the fact of his deity? Because Rome everywhere has accustomed people to think of him as the son of Mary. I talked to a woman one time who told me that she'd rather go to Mary than to Christ. Mm -hmm. There's nobody that has that much control or influence with a son as their mother, she said. If Jesus is inclined to be a bit hard-hearted... I just go to his good, kind mother, and I ask her to please say a good word to him for me. What a caricature of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, can't, I can hardly tolerate the fact that somebody willingly said that Jesus might be hard-hearted. That's just, that's, that's ludicrous to think that. We forgot to get the light on this morning. I forgot to get the light on this morning. David's giving us light. Evidently, my face looks kind of dark. You a little dark skinned. All right. Now that we've got by that, let's go on. Jesus Christ has been degraded because of this thing with Mary. Um, and many of you turned the radio on and heard the rosary being repeated, Holy Mary, Mother of God. Uh, people are praying to the saints for safety. Um, it used to be the Spencer Magna, or the, the Courier Journal, used to be uh, filled with novenas to St. Jude or novenas to some other saint. Um, there is, the scripture says there's one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. That's what it says. Observe. Jesus comes and he's, the scripture says, and, and John says about Jesus, he had eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. This speaks of his holiness and righteousness. Jesus is holy. He's 100% holy. He's 100% righteous. He never sinned one sin. He never became hard-hearted. He never did anything that would, God would have called that would keep him from being the perfect sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God, the one who was able to redeem and atone for the sins of the world. Amen. And it's by his blood that our sins are washed away. It's the baptism in His blood that cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. He must judge all that is evil. And that's what Jesus has come to do. He's come to judge all that is evil at the church of Thyatira. He did give them all about their approval. The believers in Thyatira were a busy lot. They didn't have time to do anything, but they were busy. Jesus never overlooks what we can what can be commended. He goes on to say, I know your works and charity and service and faith and patience and your works. Uh, the last of your works are greater than the first of your works. In other words, you're getting busier for Jesus all the time. Man, that's a, that is... <laughs> Every preacher would love for a church to be like that. 
to, for their works to just keep get, getting better and better all the time. The Lord gave Rome credit for a great deal that is good. Remember, from the 7th century to the present, there has been a great deal in the way of good works in the Roman Catholic Church that cannot be overlooked. There have been Roman Catholic nuns and monks who have been ready to lay down their lives for the needy and for the sick. And I suspect that if we look into the hearts of the 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 monks and the nuns and the priests who were willing to do this, who were willing to lay down their life, I suspect that a great deal of them were filled with the, the love of Jesus Christ in their hearts. I suspect there's a great many of the Roman Catholics in those days gone by that were born again Christians, born again believers, true believers, true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's been many a Roman Catholic that were there to help create hospitals. They All of the hospitals were created from where they lived. Where they lived, then the first thing you know, they, they were taking care of sick people. And before you know that, the sick taking care of the sick people turned into a hospital. Now that's pretty good work. And it's pretty good to have compassion for those who are sick. It's pretty good that people lay their lives down and stand between harm's way and the people uh, who are troubled. We need to understand this. The Lord does not forget that at all. Where there's a bit of faith, he loves to take note of it. If there are hearts in the church of Rome that amid all the superstition reach out to the blessed Lord himself, he meets them in grace and demonstrates his love to them. And I have always suspected that the church of Rome was filled with people who are believers, not completely full of it. If... There are believers in the church of Rome. Amen. But God had an accusation against the people at Thyatira. The Lord found too much to expose and condemn in the assembly, and he did it. And here's no amount of loving and sacrificial works can compensate for tolerance of evil. You know, when I, the more I think about this church, the more I think they must have been kissing cousins or sister cities with the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth, just they just loved everybody. And they just tolerated sin like nobody's business. Paul had to get on them sternly. Jesus Christ is sternly on the church of Thyatira. The church was permitting false prophetess to influence the people and lead them into compromise. We have one group who says we must repent of our sins so we can get saved. Another group says you're not saved until you're baptized. That's a bunch of bunk. The Bible says that those who believed and are baptized will be saved, but it, does, it also said those who do not believe will be lost. And it, it does not say that you have to be baptized. In fact, the Apostle Paul spent a whole book in the book of Galatians preaching against circumcision. And, and he the whole point of the book of Galatians, if you add anything to salvation other than what is there, you're preaching another gospel. That's right. We do not add anything to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says, he that believeth in the Lord Jesus Christ is born again. He that believeth on the Son hath life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. The words of Jesus Christ, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. And there's two things there. 
If you believe on Jesus Christ, you shall not perish. Never, ever perish. The other thing of it is, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. That means everlasting life. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you have everlasting life, your everlasting life will never end. And you will never quit believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have one group that says you can lose your salvation. We have uh, another group who focuses on the elect, but they admit that they don't know if they're personally in the elect. Well, if you're not one of the elect, you're not going to be saved. Well, there's no need to going out witnessing to people because the, the elect's going to get saved whether they want to or not. <laughs> That's ridiculous. What it really amounts to is both of these groups who says you can lose your salvation and the other group who says that you're, you're not saved unless you're a part of the elect, they're both looking at the works. That's right. We're looking at the fruit. We're, we've become fruit inspectors, and sometimes our method of inspection of fruit is faulty. It's not whether we've got fruit hanging on a tree. It's whether we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are people who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ who really are afraid to say to their family, look, I put all my trust in Jesus Christ. There are people who, if they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today and they tell their family they're going to be run off or killed. Now, there are those who say tithing isn't scriptural and go to great lengths to make their case. I got that in the wrong place. Sorry. The assembly and Thyatira were growing in their love, but too tolerant of false doctrine. Both extremes must be avoided in the church. There are people who love too much. There are people who love so much they won't even dare say anything about what the, the people they love are doing wrong. They just, get, they just let them keep right on going. They won't say a word. I was in a family gathering one time and there was people in that family who was stealing from the grandparents, they were stealing from the parents, they were stealing because they had a drug addiction. And I told the family, I said, nobody in this family loves that person. And I got hooted out of the holler. I said, if you loved him, you'd take a baseball bat and beat him up. <laughs> you'd stop that stealing. Now, I literally, you know, some of them thought that I meant you'd take a baseball bat and just kill him. That's not what I meant. You know, there was a day and age in this land where when people got out of line, families come in and did something about it, and they brought them back in line, or they sent them on the road. And I mean that, and I stand by that. We, as the people of God, should not love people so much that we can't tell them that they're doing something wrong. If somebody is coming in and, and they're stealing from their parents or stealing from the grandparents or stealing from everybody they know, they're full of uh, manipulation. They will tell you lies in order to get you to do what they want you to do. They will manipulate you. Somebody needs to set them down and, and love them enough to do something about it. Families need to step up and be families and quit loving to the nth degree. Love does, you know, the love of Jesus Christ constrained him to the cross. Well, we're not Jesus Christ, and we, we are to quit constraining ourselves to just die on a cross so that somebody else can be full of sin. We need to tell them, you're sinning. What you're doing is wrong. 
We need to step up. Speaking the truth in love is a biblical balance. Ephesians 4.15, unloving orthodoxy and loving compromise are both hateful to God. We cannot be unloving while we're beating our relative up. <laughs> I could tell a story about that, but it's not about beating somebody up. The assembly needs to speak the truth in love. Not only was the church a tyrant a tolerant of evil, but it was proud and unwilling to repent. Mm. The Lord gave the false prophetess time to repent, yet she refused. Now he was giving her followers an opportunity to repent. His eyes of fire had searched out their thoughts and motives, and he would make no mistake. It, Jesus still does that today. He knows the thoughts and intents of our heart, and he will make no mistake when he brings judgment to us when we refuse to repent. <sighs> <clears throat> the Lord threatened to use this assembly as a solemn example to all the churches. God is, God is judging the church in America more than he's judging the, the country of America. We have been run over because we have tolerated evil. Amen. Jezebel and her children would be sentenced to tribulation and death. There are churches that have dried up and died because they refuse to come against evil. They just sit in their thing. They just want to be comfortable. I understand that. I would. There, you don't just understand. I'm an introvert in a lot of ways, and and I get my strength from just being by myself. And uh, introverts do that. Extroverts get their strength from being around other people. That's their heyday when they go to the horse show and they talk to everybody there. <laughs> it's not a horse show for all of you, but you, you understand that. Some of us get our strength from being around other people. Idolatry and compromise are in the Bible pictured as fornication and unfaithfulness to the marriage vows. The church today has committed fornication with the world. Jezebel's bed of sin would become a bed of sickness. To kill with death means to kill with pestilence. God would judge the false prophetess and her followers once and for all. This is God's admin, uh, his criticism of the church of Thyatira. He gives an admonition to the people of Thyatira. Not everyone in the assembly was unfaithful to the Lord, and he had a special word for them. If you're being faithful, God's got a special word for you. They had separated themselves from false doctrine and compromising practices of Jezebel and her followers, with Christ, which Christ denounces as the depths of Satan. The Lord had no special demands to make on the, these people. Those who are fa faithful, those who haven't gone after the spirit of Jezebel, He simply wanted them to hold fast. And the resistance to evil. God's saying that to some of you today. Hold fast. Hold on to what you got. Put a chalk down behind your tire. Don't let this thing go any further. Till I come refers to Christ. Return for his people, at which time he will reward them for their faithfulness. This is the first mention in Revelation of the Lord's coming for the church. The event we commonly call the rapture. We, you can find that in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. In contrast, a reference in Revelation to Christ's return uh, to earth in judgment to defeat his enemies and establish his kingdom. Jesus is coming, but he's coming first in the rapture, and when he comes at the second coming of Christ, and I hear a lot of preachers that don't know the difference between the rapture and the second coming. 
I hear a lot of preachers reference, reference, uh, reference the second coming of Jesus Christ, and they never mention the rapture. The, the rapture to them is totally silent. It's the, it, evidently, it's just not a part of their, their thing. I, the rapture is what I'm looking for. Amen. I'm looking for Jesus Christ to blow the trumpet or the angel to blow the trumpet and Jesus Christ to shout and catch me out. Amen. I'm looking for the uptaker. I'm not looking for the undertaker. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uptaker, come and get us quick. We're in a mess, but we caused our own mess. The church of Jesus Christ in America stood by as Hollywood took over and told us what to think. The church of America stood by silent to the most part when abortion became legal. The church of Jesus Christ stood by silent for the most part when Lyndon Johnson got the amendment passed to make churches of, that they couldn't say anything about the election. And by the way, I'm going to say something about the election. Praise God. <laughs> Go for it. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to say this, if you vote for somebody that cusses every other word to be uh, elected official in Spencer County, there's something wrong with your Christianity. That's right. If you are voting for somebody because they're a good old boy, there's something wrong with your Christianity. You need to search out what you do when you come to election time, and you need to make sure that you vote for somebody who stands up for godly principles. We don't need somebody who loves abortion. We don't need somebody who loves homosexual marriage. We need men and women in our offices in Spencer County, Kentucky, who will stand up for the truth, who will stand for some kind of righteousness. Amen. Not every man that's running for office is a saved and born-again man or a woman. But there are those who may not be saved who do stand for the most part for righteousness. And there are some who claim salvation who got the pottiest mouth I've ever heard on a person. When elected officials come around and cuss and talk about their, their employees publicly and cuss every other word and say how bad that is, that's not... Godly in my notion. And elected officials need to be accountable to the people in Spencer County. And for that matter, for the uh, state of Kentucky, elected officials need to be accountable. And for the, the United States, Christians, the church needs to stand up and to vote for elected officials who will stand for the Word of God as, as much as possible. Lest I get to naming names, I'm going to move on. <laughs> now look, idolatry and compromise are considered like the marriage vows. When we have something that we worship more than Jesus Christ, that's a called idolatry. Our own self, we could worship our own self. I I don't know how many times I see on Facebook and different places selfies, 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 selfies. Really? Yeah. Jezebel's bed <laughs> would become sickness. Now look. This is, this is in contrast. The believers in Thyatira are promised authority over the nations, which probably refers to the fact that God's people will live and reign with Jesus Christ. I heard a preacher preaching yesterday who preached a pretty good message, but he did not delineate that there will be a thousand-year reign after the rapture, after the tribulation. When Jesus comes at the second coming of Jesus Christ, there will be a thousand-year reign. While Jesus is here on earth, there will be perfect government. There will be, Satan will not be in the picture Amen. for a thousand years. Wow. This is what he's talking about. For those who overcome, they will rule and reign with me. And he is saying, for those of you who hang on to what you got, who don't let your 
chalk slip. If you have to, chalk your chalk. It, you know what I mean? For those of you that went looking for a big old rock to throw under your tar, you, you've seen sometimes that some rocks don't hold. You go get another rock to chalk your chalk. Check your spirit. Check your spirit. Amen. Somebody said, check your spirit. Check your spirit around here and in your own life. How are you operating? What kind of a spirit is driving you? He will rule with a rod of iron. And we will rule with a rod of iron. It's just what we want, isn't it? You would like now to take your rod of iron and go to Washington, D.C. and peck somebody on the head. Amen. You might want to peck a whole lot of people on the head. There you go. Look, we're going we're gonna to be right, ruling with a rod of iron, but it's a good thing we don't have a rod of iron right now. Amen. Because <laughs> we would make mistakes. We are walking and living and, and moving a lot of times more in the flesh than we are in the spirit. And sometimes when we are totally in the flesh, we think we're in the spirit. But the trouble is, it's not a spirit of Jesus Christ. It's not a good spirit. Sometimes when a bad spirit takes over, we lose control. You know, you get up early in the morning, you get in a bad mood, you go through traffic for an hour and a half getting to work. Things don't go good in traffic. Too many, you know, too many people, idiots on the road, right? That's, isn't that what we say? And, and then you come home and it gets worse and people, everybody's wanting to get home after work and the, the traffic is worse. And on the way home, if you're coming out of J-Town, every red light is rigged against you. Yeah, that's right. They, I, I promise you, every red light is rigged against you. And, and you, you just say... If they would just go on, I could get through the next red light. Amen? And when we get home, our wife don't have breakfast, supper ready. Uh -oh. And there sits the cat. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you should have just kicked the cat first thing when you left for work. Amen? For you cat lovers, I'm going to get messages on Facebook. Uh -oh. <laughs> Look. A spirit takes over us. We fight it until we give into it. And when we give into it, we just let it all come loose. And we're hateful and mean and obnoxious. And Jesus is sitting up there saying, oh. I died for him or her. Lord, help him. Look, Jesus Christ is a bright and Mormon star. God suggests that the people will be so closely identified with Christ that he will belong to them. This morning when we were singing Glorious Day, I was just picturing in my mind what Jesus Christ had done to me for me. And look, can we picture in our mind the love that Jesus had for us? Can we focus on that when the traffic is bad? Can we focus on that when our day doesn't go well? When Can we focus on that when everybody at work is, seems to want to irritate us who do things particularly to try to irritate us? Can we focus on the fact that we are with Jesus Christ and that he, what He did for us? Can we focus on his, the amount of love He had for you and me? For Him to die on a cross, who for Him to suffer what He had to suffer through, for Him to be beaten with a whip with a cat of nine tails that had bone and metal plaited into the whip, when he was whipped repeatedly with the whip 
the bone and the metal would grab his flesh and jerk chunks of flesh out of his back and out of his sides. And that his visage was marred more than that of any man. That's what the scripture says. Jesus Christ loved us that much. Can we focus on that when our boss is getting in our nerve? Can we focus on that when the, the idiots that uh, are on the road are, are just no more of an idiot than we are? Can we focus on that when our day does not go well? Can we focus on that when what we're trying to do all comes unraveled? Can we focus on what Jesus did for us? Our days get bad sometimes, and we want to kick the cat and cuss our neighbor. But we need to focus on what Jesus Christ did for us. Amen. Satan is named Lucifer, which in Hebrew means brightness, bright star. The, the com compromising people in Thyatira were following the depths of Satan, which would lead to darkness and death. God overcomes, on the other hand, and we will be like the morning star. We will share the morning star with, with those other believers who believe the same way we do. Jesus Christ died for us. He loves us unbelievable. He loves us when we stink. How many of you ever changed the, your di baby's diapers? You open that thing up and you say, <laughs> but you go back and you change that baby because you love it. Jesus has changed us a time or two. And we stunk worse than that diaper. Amen. Look, if you get on the internet, you're going to find all kinds of false doctrine. You're going to find things that will support anything you want to come up with. <clears throat> I've lost part of my outline, but let me get back to it. <clears throat> I'm just going to tell you what God put in my heart. Our ch churches are full of false doctrine. They've got everything under the sun to say that's wrong. And you can get on the internet and you can find stuff to support that the earth is flat. Yep. <laughs> We've known for a, a thousand years that the earth is round. The Bible talks about the circle of the earth a long time before the astronomers found out the earth was round. Now we're going back to well, the earth is really flat. NASA's been fooling you all the time. Those pictures they're taken from outer space, that's just fake. Let me tell you something. The earth is not flat. You can find information on the internet that tithing is not for the New Testament. You can find information on the internet that says all kinds of stupid stuff. You can get the inter internet to agree with what you want it to say. Mm -hmm. You can get the internet to agree with you that homosexuality is right. Mm -hmm. But the scripture says in the New Testament and the Old Testament that homosexuality is wrong. That's what it says. And it is ungodly. And if a person is not saved and, and they're that way, they're going to keep on and, until they get saved. And if they really get saved, God will give them the power to overcome that. Now we've got the illustrious state of California who wants to ban Bibles. They want to ban anybody to do anything that will help people to get on the right track with the Word of God. Now look, we've got people who want to take Leviticus. I know I'm going to make some people mad with this one, but I'm getting ready to do it. <clears throat> 
Ye shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantment, nor observe times. You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shall you mar the corners of your beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you, for I am the Lord. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom, and the land become full of wickedness. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Regard them not." that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. God said in this, I am the Lord your God. Amen. Now, people want to take the passage, the part about do not cut your hair, and they want to say, well, listen, you can't believe about the tattoos. I'm going to tell you something about the people who said don't cut your hair haven't looked up at the scriptures. They haven't investigated deep enough. The part about cutting your hair is about cutting your hair like the heathens do. It's because you cut your hair to represent something. You can get people to cut your hair. You can get all kinds of patterns cut in your hair. You can have any kind of pattern cut in your hair you want to if you've got a, somebody with that talent. The whole point of this scripture is not to look like and act like and smell like and live like the world. If you want to get tattoos and cover your body up with tattoos and look like the world, go ahead. But that's what, that's what Jesus is talking about with this church. That's what Jesus is saying. You're living like the world. You have taken on the, the world's thoughts. You have taken on what the world says. The world says that tattoos are just fine. The world says that you put a ring in your nose and put big things in your ears and you and you got you got piercings and you got horns sticking out of your skin. The world says that's pretty good. We got Bible teachers that'll get up on Facebook and on TV and say that, well look, I've come to the conclusion that tattoos is okay. This Bible says, and that God never negated the fact about tattoos or piercings or none of that kind of stuff. Don't cut your flesh for the dead. Don't do this for stupid stuff. Don't look like and smell like the world. God said this in his word, and he never anywhere in the New Testament negated it. Now, I've said all that to say this, and some of you out there that's watching are covered up with tattoos. You know what? You can repent. You, if, if you take them off, it's going to be painful and it's going to be very costly. I understand that. Look, just admit that it's sin. Admit that the Bible says no. Don't do it. God doesn't like that. If God didn't like it then, he don't like it now. Admit that it's sin. That's why we needed Jesus. You got people on the internet that says tithing is not for today. Well, yeah, probably. But tithing goes a lot further if we really give what God says we really are to give. But we'd be giving about 30%, not 10%. People want to take the Old Testament and say, well, that's the Old Testament. We can't do that now. We don't have to do that now. Jesus did away with the law. Jesus never one time said, I come to do away with the law. He didn't say that. He said, I came to fulfill the law. I came to take care of the law for you. All of this stuff, when we look like and stink like and, and act like the world, Jesus came to die for that. It's time for us to admit that. It's time to say that there's sin in this world. It's time for us to, the church to stand up and stand on the Word of God. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to be the church of Jesus Christ. It's time for us to stand on the Bible and to believe the whole Bible. We Look, there are people on, uh, on YouTube and all over the Internet who want to use the Bible to tear the Bible down. 
They want to say this about the Word of God. They want to say that about the Word of God. They want to make you doubt the Word of God. They want to make you doubt Jesus Christ. They want you to believe in evolution. They want you to believe everything under the sun. But we have to stand on the Word of God. And look, the church of Thyatira was a loving and kind church. But they didn't stand against the spirit of Jezebel. They did not stand up to it. They patted it on the back and said, now just don't come over here where we are. The church has to stand up and be the church. The church has to proclaim the word of God and proclaim it with love. We cannot be hard-hearted. We cannot be mean and hateful. And if you think that my passion and love for the Bible and for the Word of God and for the things of God makes me mean and hateful, I'm sorry. But I am passionate in my, my spirit this morning. It's passionate. I love Jesus Christ and I love people. But I'm going to tell you I don't love people as good as... I don't love people the way Jesus wants me to love them. I need to love more. I need to have more love flowing through me. I'm doing... I, I, pray for me. I need more love. We all need more love. But we need to love people enough to stand up for their sin and say, look, enough's enough. Stop where, where you are. Don't go any further. Call sin, sin. Don't love them so much that you just pat sin on the head. Love them. Love them. Love them dearly. Love them enough to stand up to say sin is sin. Amen? Mm. I know this is going to be a talked about sermon. God's talked about things that preachers just don't want to talk about. But if you if you come here, we're going to talk about them, and we're going to talk about them, and talk about them passionately, and we're going to talk about them in love. The churches, we all have our problems. We all have our short-sightedness. We all have shortcomings. That's what this message, going through the, these seven churches, if it don't get you somewhere, there's something wrong. Because I've been God every Sunday when I've been preaching about this. We all need to look up and listen up. And stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God will last forever. It will never end. It will never be gone away. It will stand with the Word of God and it will stand with Jesus Christ forever. It will stand with God forever. It will stand with the Holy Spirit forever. We better stand up for the Word of God and stand on it accurately. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Oh, I need to read this. Do I have time to read it? I didn't write this, but I there's a guy on Facebook that I follow after, and every time he writes something, man, he, he always speaks to me. This truth will never be popular in today's modern church, but it is the truth. If our worship does not alienate the lost, then our worship is only entertainment. Do you hear that? If our worship does not alienate the lost, then our worship is only entertainment. Uh, let me say that. There are people who argue with the music, uh, and if the music is not bopping and hopping, they don't want to go to church. Well, that's entertainment. That is flat-out entertainment. Why? God makes it clear. We are either for Him or against Him. Matthew 20, verses 30 and 33, He that is not with me is against me, and he that it gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Either make the tree good, or its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt, and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. You see, no one ever can, will worship God if they do not obey God. 
John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Remember this truth of Scripture, John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. <clears throat> we cannot worship in truth if we do not walk in truth. Thus we can know that those who are unsaved, those who still walk in disobedience to God, those who are not for God because they are against God, uh, <clears throat> Matthew 8, 12, 30, cannot enter into worship of God. If a person's not saved, they, they can't worship God. They don't know how to worship God. So... <clears throat> It, there's an alienation between those who know God and those who serve the Lord in obedience and those who do not know God and those who do not serve the Lord in obedience. And if both groups, the saved and the unsaved, both equally enjoy the time of worship being offered in church services in America and around the world, then what is truly being offered is not worship. It is only entertainment. Just as I am amazed by those, especially Christians, who remain blind to the fact that you cannot align yourself with organizations, clubs, political parties, and <clears throat> that blatantly present a platform built on things that are sins according to God and His Word. Abortion, gay marriage, LGBT rights, racism, hatred, bigotry, etc., the Democrat Party, the KKK, the Black Panther Party, the Black Lives Matter movement, Planned Parenthood, and many others. I also am amazed by especially Christians who continue to deny that what we are witnessing in churches here and around the world is not truly worship, as it is instead a presentation, a performance, based on the ability to manipulate moods with the use of visual stimulation, hype, and the subtle use of the power of suggestion. No matter how hard we try, no matter who we claim, who claims otherwise, when we make an appeal to our eyes, when we seek to draw people through the lust of the eye, what we are doing is not of God. <clears throat> 1 John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Oh, I know the argument, what we're going to do does not equal to appealing to lust. Folks, that's a lie. When we seek to draw anyone through what they see, we are appealing to their desires, their lust for something. Tell me, how often in life does beauty become doorway to deception? How often in life do we discover that what first appeals to us visually is often what leads us astray? <clears throat> there is nothing wrong with beauty unless it's being used to lure someone in some form or fashion. <clears throat> so tell me, do we truly believe that true Christians must be lured, manipulated into worship? Do we truly believe that using mood lighting to create an atmosphere for worship? Have we truly become that shallow? No matter how many argue otherwise, what is now happening in the modern church today is not of God. It's something mystical, something mood-altering, something bordering on the demonic work of Satan, even though the songs mention Jesus. Oh, I've heard many say, the Bible says that there's a great light display all around the throne <clears throat> with thunder and lightning constantly surrounding the worship of those around the throne. He said, really, is that your argument? Uh, let me be clear in exposing that argument for what it really is. Pathetic, ridiculous, and totally lacking in wisdom and discernment. You see, unless those displays <coughs> of nature accompany our worship of God on their own, unless those things miraculously occur without any help from man, then our attempt to create things similar to these displays of nature through technology is nothing more than an attempt to mimic something for the sake of visual stimulation. In other words, what's occurring around God's throne is not some attempt by God to hype worship. It's, very, it's the very creation of God offering worship. 
The Bible says all creation worships, worships the Lord. So nothing we see in Scripture is designed to aid or stimulate worship. <clears throat> we only find things that instruct us how we must worship. <clears throat> Thus, this brings me back to my initial statement of truth spoken here from the outset. If our worship does not alienate the lost, then our worship is only entertainment. Folks, no attempt to use worship to attract the lost will ever truly be of God. Never, never, never do we find in Scripture a time when worship was designed to attract the lost. <clears throat> Why? Worship is not an attraction. It's a reaction. We worship God. <clears throat> we worship because God is God. Our reaction to truth, God being the only one worthy to be worshipped, is manifested through worship. <clears throat> Thus the lost, those who are unsaved, those who continue to reject Christ, can neither, need, neither be drawn by worship nor react to worship. Somehow the modern church wrongfully believes it can perform the work of the Father. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. <clears throat> Can we draw them to Christ? Can our programs draw them to Christ? Can our magnificent building draw them to Christ? <clears throat> well, we don't have a magnificent building. Thank you, David. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> I, di I didn't look up. I didn't see who brought it. It's an angel. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about worship should alienate the lost because it reveals the lost. It exposes the lost. It biblically excludes the lost. First Corinthians one eighteen. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. <clears throat> if the gospel is foolish to the <clears throat> foolishness to the lost, then our worship is foolishness to the lost. Thus, if the lost can say, "I like the worship at your church," then your offering of worship is foolishness. <clears throat> He ain't cutting no slack here, folks. No. There will be millions in hell who once worshipped in church, but they never worshipped God. If we continue to insist on seeking to use worship as some method of evangelism, we will do nothing more than continue to pervert worship, muddying the waters of true worship. <clears throat> That's a strong word, and it's by a gentleman on Facebook that I follow by the name of Ron Smith. I probably don't agree with every doctrine that Ron Smith has, but I'm going to tell you what. <clears throat> he cuts through the what other people won't talk about. If our worship is appealing to lost people, then it's probably entertainment. <clears throat> If we had to have songs to jump up and down and hop around with to feel like we're worshiping, we have brought in entertainment. <clears throat> we cannot duplicate what God created. <clears throat> God created man. We can, we can clone people. Our scientists can. But God had his own dirt. And they can't take dirt and make somebody. And if they could, they, they'd have to go get their own dirt to duplicate what God did. That's right. <clears throat> Amen. They had to make the dirt first. <laughs> they had to make the dirt first. The Word of God is what we need to stand on. Right. And the Word of God says, Jesus Christ died for us. He that believeth on the Son hath life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. In other words, if you haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a dead man walking. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, you can be the president of the United States, you can be the president of Russia, you can be the governor of whatever state you want to be. If you haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a dead man walking. That's right. And you're going to bust hell wide open. 
when you die. And when you die, nobody's going to pray you out of purgatory because right. it can't happen. Right. It's got to be settled while you're alive. That's why the law says don't get tattoos. That's why the law says don't cut yourself for the dead. That's why the Lord law says thou shalt not commit adultery. That's why the law says thou shalt not murder. That's why the law says don't tell a lie. If you've done any of those things, the law is trying to say you need Jesus. Please, please, don't let my strength of my words turn you away from the soft heart that Jesus has. Jesus died so that we could live. <clears throat> We're no better than anybody else. But we do have the, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> I invite you today, think about your sin. Confess your sin to Jesus and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you would draw people to yourself. We ask that you would, by the power of the blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, speak to hearts. Let them know that they need Jesus. Oh, God, <clears throat> let us not be hard-hearted as the church. Let us, let us be repentant where we need to repent. Let us love people more. Help us, Father, to show the love of Jesus Christ in a better way than we do. Every one of us need that. God, help us to not tolerate false doctrine. Help us to not tolerate it. Help us to not pat it on the head. Help us, Lord, to be truthful to those and help us to not love people in a way that is not profitable. Help us to love people enough to tell them the truth, to turn them from their sin. Help our spirits, Lord. Our spirits are broken. We let everything in the world control us and, and drive us. We want to live like the world. We want the approval of the world. And Lord, that's sin. And we confess it. And God, help us to keep our doctrine straight. Help us to keep our lives straight. And Father, speak to hearts all over this world. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> David, do you have it ready?